space specifically. Um, we wanted there to be a space for discussing race, identity, and motivation that was visible and cross-discipline and cross-institution to allow for a little bit more depth um, and breadth. And then our hope is that these faculty members, that they can, they can sort of support each other in creating these new classroom innovations, some kind of project um, that integrates their students' identities and their, sense, their students' sense of purpose. And it ultimately builds both of these institutions' abilities to like better serve and engage with these students in a way that um, that speaks to them personally, that feels a little bit more about who they are, um, and that they're that they're really seen and known. Um, a lot of I always go back to this conversation that Caitlin and I had multiple uh, many years ago with somebody from public health who was saying a lot of a lot of our students they just don't feel known at our institutions. Nobody really knows who they are, and they don't feel like anybody knows who they are. And our goal is to try and increase that sense of having a real, um, they have an imprint on the university and the, the, on the college and the colleges also have an imprint on them. Okay, what do we have? So our model really focuses and centers on identity and purpose. Um, somebody once said, you know, like, what is it, whose identities are we, what does identity really mean? We try to think about identity as broadly as possible. We think about, especially with these faculty seminar series, um, we are thinking about their sense of racial identity, for sure, um, their ethnic backgrounds, and also how those ethnic and racial identities are positioned vis-a-vis -vis Latinx communities, vis-a-vis -vis Black communities, how many communities of color have been triangulated against each other in various ways. And there's a very unique experience of being Asian American that's separate from being another person of color. Um, and wanting to kind of critically engage with that, that's something that we're where we try to provide the opportunity for. We also try to help them, again, develop their sense of purpose as a college student, um, kind of taking steps to be their own agent and really thinking about self-determination, which many of the um, faculty who are presenting today are gonna talk about as well. Um, and we try to incorporate these evidence-based practices that have been shown before to be instrumental in helping students feel like um, their identities are relevant to the classroom, even if this is a, uh, even if, but for many folks, people will say like in a STEM classroom, for example, how am I going to bring in identity? Um, if it were, I'm teaching, you know, a biology class, how do I, how do I still um, make this a space where students feel like their, their identities are known and, and important? So that's something that we're also trying to think about um, incorporating what's been found before to show that students' sense of identity and purpose are more relevant in all classrooms. And ultimately that this, this is, um, with the goals of increasing student retention, GPA, and graduation rates. So at the, we've used this slide now three times, um, and we try to make this really, uh, you know, point kind of uh, that we're not really trying to say that there's one way to teach. We know that everything is very discipline, context specific. Um, we we actually originally called these kind of faculty working groups, um, kind of in the model that I think that Assert did in the summer of the the first summer of the pandemic, where people got together just to talk about different aspects of large classroom teaching or, or different things. So we really wanted to see this as a place where it's not we're training people on a particular pedagogical model. We're getting people together to talk about how we can incorporate some of these ideas into our classrooms and kind of learn from each other. So sorry about this. I just heard Joel said that it's been hard to read these sides. Sorry about that. Hopefully oh. this is a little bit better. But um yeah. Well, yeah, go yeah. And then we can go to the next slide. Okay, great. Okay. So here's, here's a little bit about what the faculty seminars aim to do for um, and what, what, the, um, what the participants are expected to do. First, they're expected to identify and reflect on their various student needs in the classroom, especially respect to differences in racial and cultural experience, immigration stress, and financial need. We want folks to be it, like really engaging with um, various identities and various stressors that the students are experiencing. We also want folks to be engaging with their own racial and cultural background as it relates to their, their being an instructor so we talk a lot about power and positionality and how they, their, their um, students, and participants, their students perceive them. How do they wield power in the room? How do they try to share power? What are ways that they can be collaborative? What, what feels not as comfortable in terms of being collaborative? It's really just about kind of figuring out where they are on their own trajectory. Um, and ultimately the goal is that they create or design one or more teaching interventions. So this could be a classroom activity, an assignment or a project, a teaching tool, um, for a specific course that they are going to roll out that incorporates culturally relevant pedagogies and their students' identities in some explicit manner. And throughout, we also expect that they participate in small groups discussion and that they 
provide and receive feedback for incorporating their student experiences into the class. Um, it ultimately is the, the seminar goes for four different sessions. It's usually four consecutive weeks in January and four consecutive weeks in June um, on Wednesdays from one to 3.30. And then there's a kickoff beforehand a couple of weeks before we start. And there are some reunion sessions that are an hour and a half, like uh, a couple months down the line where people then can report back about what it was like in terms of rolling out that project and seeing if it was, um, see if it worked out. If it doesn't work out, totally great. But like, let's reflect on how that process has been. Um, we also ask them to promote all our things, obviously, as we do you guys. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, it's a good transition. Now we can move to talking uh, and hearing from three of the seminar participants. This is, um, I put the webpage here where these three um, participants have, have actually posted on our CUNY Commons site um, their projects. So you can you can um, see more about what, what they're talking about um, on that site. And then just this kind of, we, we go over this also when we, as our kickoff is just those three, those three pillars of identity, purpose and belonging. So you can kind of see how how we think about those things. So I think we have our three participants now that are gonna present. I think we're gonna go with Aisha, if you're out there, um, if you can, there she is. Yeah, great, hello. <laughs> so thanks for, and just, we started recording halfway through there. We're gonna keep recording, I think, through Sarah's just at the end, and then we're gonna stop recording as we always do um, for, for discussion and stuff like that. So if you, are you able to, Aisha, uh, share your screen if you need to and uh, take I, it away? Yes. I... Great, thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I am Aisha Terman. I uh, am an adjunct in the English department at Hunter. Um, I uh, rolled my project out with um, uh, the idea of using it in an English 320 course that I have. Of course it doesn't wanna load. We were just on the screen. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, and my English 320 course, I've, I've taught several, but the one that I was getting ready to teach is uh, was um, multi-ethnic American literature. And so we read novels, poetry, and short stories. And because um, the course, I mean, it's really, really diverse. It's basically every type of person you could think of in terms of reading, um, except for um, straight white men, like that's <laughs> really the course, right? Um, and so uh, I centered the course around the notion of passing and what uh, what is passing and what that means. And so, and it means many different things and there are many ways you can pass uh, purposefully and inadvertently. And we also read the novel, uh, the novella um, Passing by Nella Larson. So I wanted to give you that uh, as a little brief introduction. So the title inspiration again comes from uh, Nella Larson's uh, 1929 novella set in Chicago and in Harlem, um, both of the main characters are African-American women and they reconnect after many years apart. One passes for white um, and it's currently a film on Netflix. Um, and then there was also this uh, Broadway musical that I saw, uh, oh, I can't believe I saw it that long ago, 2008 called Passing Strangely, right? And so the protagonist is this anonymous young black man and he passes through a variety of experiences um, to get to the real, like what is life? What is, what is the meaning of all of this? And it was inspired, Stu says it was inspired by this stanza in Othello, which I have placed uh, on the screen. So it's from act one, scene three, lines 158 to 163. Um, and so that is what he based his idea on uh, his uh, play on uh, passing strangely. So this is what I did. So here's my course, multi-ethnic American literature. So um, again, we read basically everyone except for straight white men um, and poetry, fiction, nonfiction. Um, we talk about code switching, um, assimilation, uh, um, liberty, limitation, all of these things that pop up in the discourse. And we read a wide range of people. So our first text is Pauline Hopkins' uh, Talma Gordon, which is uh, believed to be, and I believe it is true, is uh, the first 
a detective short written by or published by an African-American, right? So we literally read from like 1890 all the way up to the, the present. Um, and so, and it really gives students a good grounding and understanding that people have been thinking about these things for a very, very long time. Like this is not a new thing. Race, talking about race isn't new. Talking about gender isn't new, even though it may seem that it's kind of new because of all of the things that we are seeing in public discourse right now. And so these are the objectives of the course, but let's get into the project. If I can find where my little um, mouse has gone, there we go. So, Basically, there we go. Where have you gone? Of course, my technology on a on a Tuesday. Okay. It doesn't want the next screen. It's okay. So basically, uh, over the Laisha, losing you a little bit. Course of the text over the course of the term, my own personal work and the work bell hooks. I introduce students to scholarly personal narratives. I want them to be able to write about um, their lives and who they are in relation to the texts that we have read, read for the term. So that is the goal. So at the end of every unit, I broke the class up into four units. At Towards the end of every unit, I give them a question um, about that relates to passing some kind of way. And they have to quote at least two of the texts, okay, that we read, it's, we skipped the space, um, a line. Um, they have to read at least two of the texts that, that we've read. And they my students are, you know, they're like, oh, talk about myself. What you mean talk about myself in a, in a class? And I'm like, no, you're gonna talk about yourself. So, uh, um, we use scholarly personal narratives, and then also they had to post uh, before class just on Blackboard, and I would draw from their discussion posts for our course discussion, um, three to five questions or comments that showed that they really read the text. Um, and so, and I can tell as if we all can when students don't, but they were really good with doing that because I think that because of the notion of, of passing and what we're talking about in class, they were able, they were able to get into the work. Now, the, the course I, I did this with was uh, in this past fall. And my class was super diverse as classes at Hunter tends to be. So it was a really good mix in terms of students and experiences and age. So um, again, we talk about passing, not just in terms of uh, race, but we talk about gender, sexuality, socioeconomic status, um, all of these things we talk about in terms of passing. Uh, perceptions of race and identity. So how do your friends or family perceive you? So the first things we're, we're reading are, one is Toni Morrison's recitative and that, and you don't know, you are not told explicitly which one of the two main characters is white and which one of the two main characters is black. So we have a lot. Um, again, we also read uh, Talma Gordon and we start to get into um, Maxine Han Kingston a little bit. So we read a few pieces at the beginning of the class where students begin thinking about how are they perceived by others. Then the next uh, is called being the immigrant or the other. And we're reading more um, pieces from people who are immigrants to the US. And so how do you perceive yourself? Like, who do you think you are in the world, right? The next one is homelessness and cosmopolitanism. How does the world perceive you? Uh, where do you feel at home? And students, I mean, I'll get to that in a second about the things that they wrote. Um, and then the last part is black and brown futurism, uh, love, resistance, and identity. What does the world need to look like or, or have so that you can be your full self? And so that those are the units that I have. And those are basically the, uh, the meat of the question that I asked them to write about. So what wound up happening? Tons of engagement because 
students don't often get to read people that are similar to them, right? And then when we start having the discussion, students are like, oh, my family does, does that too, or my family did that too. And they're starting to think about that and what that means. And so, of course, we wind up talking about imperialism and colonization and all of these things. Um, and, you know, I write transformational engagement because, I mean, I had students who were like, I've never been able, I've never been asked about these things about myself before, not personally and definitely not in a classroom setting. And so it's been challenging for me to write, but also to be able to think about these things in this kind of way has, you know, has really moved me. Like I've had, I had students who came to office hours with some tears. Um, so it was, I mean, it was great. And their, their, their writing was so vulnerable, so heartfelt, and it was still scholarly, which is what I wanted, right? Um, and so they're, tell, they're, they're sharing all kinds of things. And then they wind up sharing in class as well, right? And making connections again across culture. Um, basically by the end of the term, and when I say engagement, of course, it's the conversations we're having. It's students actually speaking up in class because they're like, oh, you know, you can see the light bulbs going off. But then by the end of the term, the average student has submitted 28 pages total of written work. Now, this is most of my students were um, either uh, second level juniors, some first, first, second semester, first semester juniors, and a few seniors. But for them to write nearly 30 pages, and I had students who wrote more. So for them to average out almost 30 pages of work when the assignment wasn't even in you know, that assignment that they did four times it was like in you know uh and about three pages and students were like after the first one they're like we can't contain what we're writing in like five pages can we write more and I'm like sure you know and 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 so that's what the work was and again we had great conversations on um really every kind of aspect of identity that you could think of, um, every aspect. So again, socioeconomic, race, gender, nationality, everything you can think of. And students were able to tease some things out about themselves and have broader conversations. So that was my project. Thank you so much, Aisha. You're welcome. Sorry, but it, it was, uh... I think we all got the, a lot, all of it. And I'm sorry to, if it was a little stilter for you, but it, we, I think we all got it. And I, and I posted everyone saw your project so you can see the questions that she used to reframe her, the, the, the class. So that was great. We'll, we'll have some more com time for comments and questions at the end. Um, I think Hosanna, if you can go next. I think you're... Try again. Now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that button. <laughs> I have a mute button on these um, this headset that I'm really not that familiar with. Let's see. Let me get this set up. Sorry about that. So I am presenting on ungrading. Let's see, here we are. So I'm presenting on ungrading. That was my project. And um, hi from BMCC. Sorry, I have the presenter view right now and it's a very small screen. Okay, so I did um, ungrading. And I'm going to share um, a document with you um, just to have, it has resources that I used. Um, and also if you're in person, there's the QR code. Okay. 
so, <clears throat> um, so ungrading, um, a couple of things that I wanna talk about are how I think it's student-centered and student-led, um, how it supports self-determination and lifelong learning and um, how it looked like, um, how my ungrading looks like. So I, I think ungrading is definitely a, has a strength based approach. It's one that really trusts its student. It creates a learning space that welcomes all student identities, particularly identities that have been oppressed in, and rejected and marginalized in higher educational spaces. Um, so it, it's, it's a approach that is very conscious of power dynamics. And it's anti-capitalist and anti-racist in the sense that it rejects a kind of factory model of schooling. It rejects sort of the preferences that um, these educational systems can have for middle class norms, like the sort of foundational knowledge that people have with bring with them to the classroom, the behaviors, vernacular, di dialects. It rejects path pathologizing poverty and race, and it rejects that that students with less privileges must behave in ways that overcome. Um, it's student-driven learning that centers the student experience. It really invites students to connect to what's important to them to make these value-driven connections um, to what they're doing in class, um, to what has happened, is happening, and um, what will happen in their lives. Um, so, I did a lot of research. Um, often, if you look into ungrading, they cite this 1983 Ruth Butler study that was done in Israel. <laughs> um, so not particularly relevant, um, uh, conscious of how that may that has that might have outdated information. So I really wanted to find something that was more current. Um, that's in the uh, in the notes that I sent. So if you want to look at that. Um, but certainly, it sh uh, you know, the, the, they sort of encapsulated the research that it shows that students from more autonomy supportive teachers have more intrinsic motivation and perceived competence and self-esteem. They get better in grades. They have greater internalizing for learning activities and lower dropout rates. Um, uh, on, you can see some more information on the screen here. And again, um, I have, um, this article listed in the resources that I sent. Um, so how um, how does it how does it look in my classroom? So I think this is my fifth semester doing this, and every semester has been different. So this is the first time I'm doing this in person, um, and I'm already finding some differences. But how, from what I've experienced, um, uh, you have to spend a, a, some time explaining. It, uh, ungrading, right? You have to manage the expectations of students and also just sort of put forth the, your expectations of them. So I explained the process of ungrading um, and self evaluations. Um, so from previous iterations, I found that it was a lot for students to pivot to a kind of 100% ungrading model. I did that my first semester and it was really hard for students and also for me. Um, I, and I suspect that um, because this is a pandemic that there was a need for more structure and clear expectations for a grading ass assessment for online learning. Um, so um, the first time I did this, it was all based on self evaluations, but um, the following semesters, um, I've been working with students to develop a, a rubric for the semester. So, um, this is in the syllabus, uh, a breakdown of how I talk about how ungrading is incorporated. And the first assignment is a um, it is where we sort of tease out, um, this is the text of the assignment, where we tease out um, what, an, what an A will look like in the semester, what a B will look like, what a C. And so the students, um, commented, they talked about things that they wanted to do, what they, they, they thought should be modified and changed. And so ap 
they did this um, online first as homework, and then we had a larger discussion in class about um, the grading rubric, finalized it, um, sent, and then uh, added the new information back to um, the syllabus, and then resent and uploaded um, the updated syllabus. So um, self-evaluations I do mid-semester and end of semester. So that is um, incorporated into their final grade along with their essay grades and things like that. Um, so the self-evaluation really is a way for them to, um, an opportunity for them to show me, um, you know, their effort, um, work that they have done that isn't, calculated in two points. So it's really a way um, for them to um, also reconnect with the purpose that they have, um, what their purpose is for this class. Um, so I give them, um, it's, it's an English class, so I give them um, uh, suggested ways to organize their self-evaluations, particularly, you know, for students um, where this is the first time they're doing something like this. So some, some, um, some examples from student evaluation, from the student evaluation. So this semester was challenging because English is my weakest class. The middle of the semester, and I was feeling like I would drop this class, not because this class is too difficult, but because of my lack of English experience. And so this, these evaluations too give me insight in terms of um, what kind of resources that they might need. Um, this st student, found it challenging, but um, felt like they really learned how to annotate text, which made me happy. <laughs> it's nice to know if, it's nice to have feedback for the, my own work in a lot of ways. So this was also, this also gives me a guide in terms of what I, I might need to strengthen. Um, so here are some more examples. Um, I was impressed with how much I improved during the semester. So it, it's just ways for them to really sort of reflect because I, I often, you know, I have not built in, historically I have not built in sort of these self-reflection moments into my semesters, which I think are really important for students to be able to recognize their own growth um, and also just to check in with what they might need. Um, so some of the big things that um, I've come across uh, is that um, there's a concern that students might inflate their grade. So this is the end of the semester. I wanted to show how I did, uh, you know, I still tracked um, points for work that was submitted. Um, and you can kind of see in these two columns, um, uh, this is what they gave themselves for the self-evaluation, the, the right column that's highlighted. Um, and you can see that the that the first and second column, they correspond with each other. So very, very, very few students uh, inflated their grades. Um, and uh, often I had to talk to students to, to check in with them to see if they actually wanted to raise their grades because often they were, um, they, they were actually giving themselves lower grades. Um, so, and that's been consistent throughout the semester. Um, that's been a consistent experience from the semesters that I've been doing, where I've been doing this. Um, so some resources. Um, so there is a, a whole book on, on grading. Um, it's a, a collection of experiences that um, instructors have had with implementing um, uh, ungrading into their classroom. The editor is Susan Bloom. Um, particularly what I've done um, is from the um, from uh, Arthur Chivarelli. Um, again, this is noted in um, in the resource page that I um, handed out or distributed. Okay, that's it. Thanks so much, Rosanna, and thanks for sharing all those resources. Um, it's in the chat, and I also linked to your um, project again on the CUNY uh, Commons. Okay, um, great. I'll just say, I think we have one more presentation, and then we'll have time to, to talk. Um, Sarah's here from psychology. Marsha had to actually go teach, so um, she says, that, thank you everyone for coming. And we will, Sarah, if you just want to tell us when to stop recording, when you start to show the student stuff, either Abby or I will, will stop the recording. So thanks, Sarah, for coming. Thanks for having me. 
Um, so I don't have slides per se, but I do want to share my screen so that I can show you um, this assignment and some of the examples. And I'll then also go ahead and share my actual little write up that we came up with. Um, so I just want to say that I'm really grateful actually to have had the opportunity to um, go to the uh, sort of faculty support seminar <laughs> um, that Paul and Marsha put on. I was kind of not necessarily, I was thinking, is this how I want to spend my January in the pandemic last year? And actually, I, I would highly recommend that if you are interested that you definitely do it. I often find that I have a really hard time coming up with good ways to talk about important issues in my classroom, because I do feel like in my position, I need to be advocating for a lot of the amazing diverse students that we have at Hunter. Um, but I also want to recognize my background and my privilege and, and the words that I say may not be reflective of, of their feelings and their thoughts. So I found this to be overall a really good experience also to understand how important language um, can be. And this was just like one stepping stone in a continual learning process as I navigate uh, how to talk about these topics in class. But one of the things that I really wanted to do in this class, um, and this is uh, Psych 160, it's called Evolution and Behavior. And pre predominantly we have a mix of students uh, from freshmen to seniors. It's an elective. So we have a lot of students, I think, who come in thinking, oh, I'm just gonna take this. And then they go, oh, hey, we get to talk about animals. This is cute and fun. Um, and so they really start to enjoy the content of the course. And hopefully they, my goal is that you know, they walk away with a couple of fun animal facts and a good time. Um, and I think they hopefully get a little bit more than that. Um, but traditionally, I had been offering uh, what I called a short thought assignment. And because I usually teach two sections of 50 students, which equates 100, um, I had been trying to come up with ways in which I could assess their writing um, in a short version. And I would give them prompts. I would give them something like, what's the problem with flat-faced dog breeds? Or how is anthropomorphism uh, detrimental to science? And I'd ask them to share their thoughts and they had some criteria. Um, I think they had to say three things pro, th three things con. Um, and I got a little bit bored of the assignment. <laughs> and when I joined um, the series last January, I thought this is perfect. I would love to revamp my short thought assignment into something that is, looking at diversity and inclusion and the history um, of uh, underrepresented groups and animal behavior as a field. And what I ended up coming up with um, was revising this short thought assignment to really focus on two key papers that had just come out by one of our larger societies. One paper um, is a great overview of women in um, animal behavior, because we actually do see now that there are a lot of women in the field, but historically this was not the case. And the paper talks about concepts that are extremely unfamiliar to students, things like the history of spousal hires in animal behavior and how sometimes if you were at an, the same institution with your significant other, that you could not essentially be employed there as well. And what this meant for women, um, and they highlight specific researchers, which I think is fantastic, women that broke barriers. And then the other paper that came out as well in this same um, issue is a paper on um, um, specifically diversity and inclusion activisms um, and more of a historical approach. So bringing up the names of individuals from uh, underrepresented groups who just either never got a chance to make their way through animal behavior or individuals who kind of were oddly forgotten about. Um, fantastic minds who then later essentially uh, did fantastic work and then 40 years later somebody won the Nobel Prize for essentially almost the equivalent of that work. But um, no one knew the original uh, author who came up with all of this work. So. Um, it's a great review of the history. And I really thought that these two papers could be a really good starting point for students to learn more about the field. So I asked them to pick one of the two papers and really focus their assignment. So writing 400 words 
um, based off of what they've read. And they have to find a couple of other additional sources. And I'm very flexible with their sources. Um, I think I asked them to find some peer reviewed sources, but there's actually a really great push in animal behavior to support um, underrepresented groups. So there's Black Mammologists Week, Black in Anthro. There's a whole bunch of different things, women in canine science, all of these things that are out there. And if they can find them, then I would love for them to talk about them. So um, encouraging also non-traditional sources is a part of, of this assignment. Um, so I asked them in general to uh, read these two papers, pick one that's of interest, and then I want them to write 400 words. And when I first started this, I asked them to write 400 words in a very structured format. And this last semester, I gave them a bunch of creative flexibility. And that's what I'm going to show you today is um, that you do get some very structured 400 word paper assignments that are fantastic, but you also get a ton of creative work as well. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, so I can show you some of these assignments. And then, Paul, this may be the time to stop the recording. Um.